I want to welcome you all to this very special occasion. It's always great when we gather here at the Society. I'm Dennis Fury, president of the Historical Society, and again, we're so glad to have you here. This is an exhibition too long in coming, and one I'm sure some of you long time uh, members of the Boston community and knowledgeable of the Historical Society thought what was very unlikely to ever be seen here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Now, the MHS would like to take full credit for this idea, but it was the Forbes House Museum that approached us to consider an exhibition on the Irish famine and the, uh, the mission that Robert Bennett Forbes led on the Jamestown to, pro to provide relief. Catherine Shannon, our guest scholar, was leading the charge. After that first visit, it quickly became an exhibit with the Jamestown mission as pivotal, as pivotal but one that looked at the breadth of the, early, of the early Irish experience in Boston. I want to thank and acknowledge the Forbes House for their partnership in making this exhibition possible. Many of the artifacts and works of art throughout have been, have been generously loaned by them. I'm embarrassed to admit, but I'm sure you are not surprised, that our collection's a bit light in this area. There are two other individuals I need to thank for their generosity, James and Margaret Sullivan. A grant from the Sullivan Foundation provided much needed support. Unfortunately, Jim Sullivan died before I could see this project come to fruition. But Margaret, his wife, told me this morning that Jim loved history and his Irish heritage and saw the tale of the Jamestown and of the Irish in Boston as a perfect project for him to support. Margaret, unfortunately, is not with us this evening. She's tending an ailing son in Colorado, but can't wait to get back to see the exhibition. Again, we thank Jim and Margaret for their generosity. Before I introduce our guest curator, let me recognize some special guests with us tonight. William Bulger, former Senate president and president, former president of the University of Massachusetts is with us. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> former Mayor uh, Raymond Flynn is with us tonight. Ray, <laughs> welcome. And I'm going to be a Gaelic challenge. The Vice Council General of Ireland, Aoife Budd, is also here tonight. Welcome. <laughs> now, Bill Fowler needs no introduction to the Boston history community, and certainly not to the MHS. A professor at Northeastern, the author of many books and articles on American history, especially maritime, a fixture on many of the city's historical boards and committees, and most importantly, my predecessor as director of the MHS. I want you to all welcome Bill Fowler. Well, good evening, everyone. A few moments ago, I suggested to Dennis that when he introduces me that he ought not to hesitate to exaggerate. <clears throat> and so I thank you for that. But I also must admit that when people say nice things about you, uh, you can become somewhat inflated. And sometimes that inflation can turn sadly. I was just reviewing my course reviews, my student course evaluations from last semester. <clears throat> and I came to one. And the student checked all the right blocks. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And then in the comments section, the student began, if I only had two hours left on Earth, I would want to spend them in Professor Fowler's class. <laughs> and then I turned the page. Because, the student went on, <laughs> Professor Fowler's classes last for eternity. <laughs> I will try to keep you from some time less than eternity this evening. It is the common practice at a moment like this to collectively thank a number of people. But I'm going to ask for your indulgence because I think the people who contributed and worked very hard on this exhibit need to be identified individually. And I would point out Una Bouchard, who's conservation here at the Historical Society, Bill Beck, who did the online content, which you can enjoy, and Ann Bentley, who manages all of the loans in and out. Chris Coveney, who's in charge of everything that's going on right now. Nancy Haywood, upstairs doing the digital reproductions. And Carol Nuff, who you've met this evening, perhaps, who's in charge of design and public relations. 
Laura Wolf here at the Society, also with Digital Reproductions, Gavin Klepseis, who has been the major domo in all of this activity, and Peter Drummy, the Society librarian who knows where everything is without ever having to look at the catalog. <laughs> and also from the Forbes Museum, Sudan Lashev, who's been very helpful. And of course, let me say finally, uh, not finally, but most importantly, uh, Catherine Shannon, a professor emerita at Westfield State University, whose kindness, whose knowledge, and good humor has gotten us through this very well. So I thank her very particularly. In the history of a community as diverse as Boston, there are many voices and many stories. The historical fabric of this city is a complicated weave with many hands. We ought never to forget that in our world, we reap the benefits of the energy, sacrifice, and hard work of generations of women and men who have come before us. They bought and paid for many of the good things we enjoy today. Not all who came were welcomed. New arrivals <clears throat> were often confronted by hostile outbursts let loose by those embedded flaws in human nature that continue to bedevil us. Bigotry, hatred, and discrimination. Some who arrived were driven away, but most persisted and remained here. They simply had no place to go. Among those were the Irish. In planning an exhibit as broad and as important as the Irish Atlantic, our committee made up of participants from this society and the Forbes House Museum, guided by some very talented designers, faced the challenge of the sheer scale of the story. How to interpret and present this history? We were blessed with the extraordinary richness of the collections of these two institutions. But that too was a challenge, how to select. We needed themes. Like all good historians, we knew where to begin at the beginning. The first Irish to arrive in Boston were those from the northern part of the island, Ulster Presbyterians. Driven off their lands in the late 18th century, they came to America by the tens of thousands. They were not welcomed in Puritan Boston, where the great eminent divine, Cotton Mather, proclaimed that the arrival of these people is simply one more way by which the devil is attempting to unsettle us. <laughs> Most of these Scots-Irish, as we have come to call them, moved west, beyond the Appalachians. But some did come to Boston. Of those, a number left and trekked north to establish the towns of Londonderry in New Hampshire and the coastal town of Belfast in Maine, names that echoed from the land from which they had come. But others remained here, often in distressed conditions. To attend to their needs, in 1737, a group of gentlemen, merchants, and others of the Irish nation residing in Boston founded the Charitable Irish Society. For the relief of their Irish brethren, poor, aged, and infirmed persons, and such as have been reduced by sickness, shipwreck, and other accidental misfortunes. This is where the exhibit begins. It begins with charity. That theme, charity, became one of the mainstays of the exhibit. It was this abiding sense of charity and connection to Ireland that stirred Bostonians <clears throat> when they learned of the great hunger, the famine in Ireland. At first, the news arrived slowly. Some dismissed the reports as exaggerated. But by early 1847, the full dimensions of the disaster were clear. Boston's Catholic bishop, John Bernard Fitzpatrick, issued a moving plea calling on his flock and others in the name of Christian charity and their own humanity to help those consumed by the fever's fire, frantic, mad with the pangs of hunger. Boston did respond in a most remarkable manner. Massachusetts Congressman Robert C. Winthrop, a member of this society, presented a petition to Congress 
signed by a number of prominent Bostonians asking permission to employ an American warship, the USS Jamestown, under the command of Robert Bennett Forbes to carry provisions to famine-stricken Ireland. Through the good work of the Forbes House, you'll be able to see documents and objects recounting the story of this ship of war turned into an angel of mercy. And so charity is a theme. Other themes emerged, some less admirable, less endearing. While some in Ireland were fed, a million died. And even more fled their homes coming across the Atlantic. Many thousands arrived in Boston, poor, desperate, unskilled. They crowded into the North End, South Cove, Fort Hill neighborhoods, where disease, most often cholera, took a devastating toll. Their rising numbers, strange customs, and religion estranged them from Boston's deep-seated Puritan Protestant traditions. Had Boston become a dumping ground? Fear of foreign influence gave rise to the Know Nothing movement. The American Party swept into power in Massachusetts. Controlled by anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic forces, the general court pushed forward a program of, quote, temperance, liberty, and Protestantism, aiming to eliminate Rome, rum, and robbery. The legislature enacted laws requiring the reading of the King James Version of the Bible in schools, and they dispatched nunnery committees to investigate certain practices at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, as well as at schools here in Boston run by the Sisters of Notre Dame. And so fear of immigration, nativist sentiment, is another yet darker theme. At a time when our nation was being torn by sectional division and the issue of slavery dominated national discourse, the ties of Boston's Irish to the Democratic Party, a party with deep Southern roots, raised questions about their attachment to the Union. Those doubts were erased, however, when the Civil War began. We Catholics, proclaimed the Boston pilot, have only one course to adopt only one line to follow, stand by the Union, fight for the Union, die by the Union. The editor of the pilot announced, we have hoisted the American stars and stripes over the pilot establishment, and there they shall wave till the star of peace returns. Governor John A. Andrew authorized the raising of the 9th Regiment of Massachusetts Voluntary Infantry, composed mainly of Irish volunteers and commanded by the Irish-born Thomas Cass, the Fighting Ninth distinguished itself in the war. Cass died from his wounds received at Malvern Hill and was buried with great honor in the Brahmin Preserve of Mount Auburn. And today, a monument stands to his memory in the Boston Public Garden. And so patriotism, an emotional link to the nation, is a theme. With peace came a resurgence of immigration. By far, the largest immigrant group in Boston, by their sheer numbers, the Irish had become a political force in the city. Pushing away Republican blandishments to join their party, Boston's Irish remained loyal to the Democrats, a party which on the national level was in disarray. Inspired in part by the rising fervor for Irish home rule, as embodied in the Irish Republican Brotherhood, better known as the Fenians, in Boston there emerged new leadership led by men such as Patrick A. Collins, who in 1868 announced from the stage of Faneuil Hall that the Democrats were, quote, organized and at work and ready to join in ballot box revolution in order to rescue the state from Republican control. Uh, the rescue mission worked, at least in Boston. Organizing from the ground up, the Boston Irish developed their own organizational structure. And in 1884, they elected Hugh O'Brien, the first Irish-born Roman Catholic mayor of Boston. Not surprising, politics is a theme. 
But political influence <clears throat> did not necessarily mean acceptance. Turned away from, shunned by the city's traditional institutions, or even when admitted, relegated to inferior status, the Irish turned inward and built within their own communities organizations to assist the poor, care for the ill, educate children, and tend to the needs of orphans and the elderly. Here, they had much in common with their Puritan predecessors, for it was Governor John Winthrop who two centuries before had charged his brethren to love mercy, to do justly, make others condition our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together as members of the same body. And like the Puritans, the Irish turned to their church, not the meeting house, but the parish. Within a few decades, under the leadership of Bishop Fitzpatrick, followed by Archbishop John Williams and Cardinal William Henry O'Connell, the number of parishes, hospitals, schools, and other institutions increased dramatically, including a new cathedral, Holy Cross, in Boston's South End. These institutions provided, and many still do, solace and care for the needy and a path to the future for the young. Institutions are a theme. While the Irish fled their island, they did not flee their culture. They brought with them a love of literature and poetry and song, taken from Ireland and reshaped in America, and often published in the Boston Pilot, these cultural artifacts were essential to keeping contact across the Atlantic. Clubs and organizations were formed, including the Clover Club, dedicated to the social enjoyment of its members, first brought together in 1883 and thriving today. So too, the ancient honor of Hibernians, whose grand building survives today in Boston's Dudley Square. No mention of Boston's Irish literary cultural scene, however, could fail to mention John Boyle O'Reilly, a political refugee from Ireland whose extraordinary life exceeds anything Steven Spielberg could ever imagine. Celebrated for his literary talents, his American patriotism, and his advocacy for civil rights, by addressing the complicated nature of American identity he sought to bridge the gap between Boston's Brahmins and the Irish. Honored in this city, his monument, created by the American sculptor Daniel Chester French, stands only a few feet away from us, just across the street. We attempted to bring that monument into the society, <laughs> but the Arts Commission objected. And so culture is a theme. And so where to end this exhibit? But there is no end. The story of the Irish, like that of all immigrant groups to our city, continues. But there is a special moment. For we end where we began, the charitable Irish society. On a mild evening in March 1912, more than 800 people gathered at Young's Hotel on Court Street for the Society's 175th St. Patrick's Day dinner. Featuring a menu of oysters, brook trout, roast jumbo squab, and fancy ice cream, by a rising vote, the recently elevated Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, William Henry O'Connell, was elected an honorary member of the Society. Sitting beside him was John F. Fitzgerald, mayor of Boston, and on the other side of the Cardinal, William Howard Taft, President of the United States. The story of the Irish in Boston is not a story of rags to riches. It is a story of rags to respectability. Please enjoy the exhibit. Thank you.